This is the lecture for John lesson number 24 covering uh, John 18 verse 28 all the way to chapter 19 verse 16. Let's let us begin with prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, it is uh, good that we come to you now in prayer as we um, study uh, your son's passion. We pray, Lord, that um, while we are grateful for all that he has done on our behalf, reconciling us as sinners to yourself, we pray that uh, in our sinful nature, we, we cannot fully appreciate what he has done for us. And so I pray, Lord, that you would, your Holy Spirit would help us to see in uh, his trials here that um, all that he has done for us and, the, and his uh, great love for us in uh, opening up our eyes to his eternal truth. It's in his name that we pray, amen. Well, within Christian theology, there is a doctrine called the two kingdoms doctrine. Different do denominations have their own variations on this teaching, but basically the two kingdoms are the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. The citizens of the kingdom of the world are born of the flesh, they are carnal-minded. The citizens of the kingdom of God or, or of Christ are spiritually minded. The people of the world fight with physical weapons. They make use of human institutions and politics and guns. Whereas the people of God are equipped with spiritual weapons, the armor of God. We, we depend on the Holy Spirit. The people in the world's kingdom fight for their place within the world's order. They are interested in earthly power and wealth. People in God's kingdom seek after an imperishable crown. They desire God and eternity with him. Appearances are very deceiving when it comes to these two worlds. The kingdom of the world seems more real to us. It's more tangible because of our physical senses. The kingdom of God is less tangible, but far more real. The kingdom of the world is passing, but the kingdom of God is lasting, it's eternal. And yet our lesson covers the portion of the gospel account that documents the world's trial of Jesus Christ, the true king, the king uh, of the kingdom of God. And because he is the true king, and because his kingdom is the only one that's going to last, we must all respond to him at some point. We must respond to the truth about him. And that's the purpose of this passage, the purpose of this message. I've divided up our passage into three parts. First, we're going to see that Pilate questions Jesus. Um, and what we're going to learn as a part of his interrogation is that truth is not an abstract concept. Truth is a person. And then we're going to see that Pilate attempts to release innocent Jesus. And what we will learn in, in these verses is that if we continue to reject God's revelation, ultimately he withdraws any further revelation. It is that, it's what we saw before, that judicial hardening. And then finally, we're going to see that Pilate relents and ends up crucifying Jesus. Uh, and that is uh, that well, Pilate is going to try to separate himself from the decision to crucify Jesus. His indifference was itself a choice to reject Jesus as king. And so we're going to come to the realization that we must choose to accept Christ or to reject him. That's really the only two possibilities. So please open up your Bibles to John chapter 18. We pick it up at verse 28. Under Roman occupation, the Jews had lost the right to execute criminals. John doesn't mention it, but the Sanhedrin had concluded that Jesus was guilty of blasphemy. But they needed Rome to carry out the death sentence. Nor normally, Pilate's palace was in Caesarea, but during the feast, it was prudent for him to be in Jerusalem. Emotions ran high during Passover, and it was then that the Jews re remembered that God's, they remembered God's deliverance of Israel out of Egypt. There was always that chance of an uprising. So Passover was the most sensitive of times, and it was prudent for the governor to be in Jerusalem to keep the peace. 
So the Jewish leaders brought Jesus to Pontius Pilate, and it's almost certain that Pilate was expecting them. The Jewish leaders had secured Roman soldiers to help in uh, arresting Jesus, and those soldiers probably reported back to him. With the Passover at hand, the Jews didn't want to enter uh, Pilate's palace. They didn't want to become ceremonially unclean. Each year, Passover opened the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, and that lasted. That feast lasted for a week. The Jews prepared for the feast by thoroughly cleaning their homes of all yeast. And God used this picture of yeast to illustrate the pervasive effects of sin. A tiny amount of yeast affects the entire loaf of bread. In the same way, sin has that, that widespread effect on us. Here we see the, these pious Jews refusing to enter Pilate's residence. At the same time, they were harboring numer uh, uh, murderous intent toward uh, an innocent man. The impact of sin on man's heart is complete. It's, sin has so infiltrated all aspects of our characters and our natures that we often don't realize our own hypocrisy. And that seems to be the case here for the Jewish leaders. Roman trials followed a very prescribed format. First, there would be a statement of accusation by the plaintiffs against the defendant. And then there would, that would be followed by an interrogation of the accused by the judge. And then a defense by the accused. In Jesus' case, there, there was no real defense offered. And then finally, there would be the rendering of the verdict and the announcement of punishment. This was the trial format that's recorded here in John's account. So first of all, the accusation. In verse 30, Pilate asked for the charge. In doing so, he caught the Jews off guard. They may have thought that Pilate would just rubber stamp their own verdict. Instead, he surprised them by demanding the charge uh, and hearing the case for himself. And the Jews' irritation shows in their response. They, they, they said, if he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Since the Jews hated the Romans, they would not have handed one over, one of their own over to Pilate, unless they had hated that person even more. Luke 23, 2 records the charges offered by the Jewish leaders. They claimed that Jesus had subverted the nation. Of course, this wasn't true. Jesus had neither subverted Israel nor Rome. The Jewish leaders saw Jesus as a threat to their own personal positions and lifestyles. They also said that Jesus opposed taxes to Caesar. And this was not true. You'll recall that Jesus had said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And in fact, he had endorsed Rome's position over Israel as being placed there by God. And then they also claimed that Jesus, uh, that Jesus claimed to, to be the Christ, a king. Now, this was true. The Jews emphasized this kingly aspect to portray Jesus as a threat to Rome. But Pilate's response shows he understood Jesus to be an innocent man from the beginning. Matthew's account states that he knew that the Jews were motivated out of envy. So, Pilate took a jab at them. He said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. And, and John makes this point here uh, because it, it shows that it, this fulfilled prophecy or scripture. Jesus was to die without any broken bones. And the Jews would have executed him by stoning, and stoning broke bones. Jesus prophesied multiple times that he would die by crucifixion. And he likened his death on a cross to Moses, raising the bronze snake on the pole. He had to be lifted up. To crucify Jesus would include both Gentiles and Jews in the collective guilt of his death. Now, having received the charge, Pilate then proceeded to his interrogation. To do so, he had to go back into the palace. Pilate went there and asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? This was what the Romans would have been interested in. Jesus responded with a question of his own. He said, is that your idea or did others 
uh, talk to you about me? Of course, Jesus knew the answer to his question. I think he was appealing to Pilate's own conscience. Pilate already understood this to be a unique case. And, he gave, and, and so Jesus gave Pilate an opportunity to reflect on the Jews' charge and to understand the real grounds for their antagonism. But Pilate missed his opportunity. He said, am I a Jew? It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. He, he shrugged this off as a Jewish issue. It was not. It included all of mankind, Jews and Gentiles. And Pilate asked then, what is it you have done? This is where I think the dialogue gets interesting. Jesus replied, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another, but, but now my kingdom is from another place. In other words, Rome, has nothing to fear from Jesus. He was not an insurrectionist. Jesus' kingdom is from heaven, and so it does not come by force, but by submission to God's will. Jesus' kingdom advances through spiritual rebirth. Remember what he told, what Jesus told Nicodemus. He says, you must be born again. Again, Pilate had an opportunity to learn the true nature of the spiritual realm. He had a pagan's view of gods. They lacked the majesty and the power and holiness of the Lord. And the only thing that Pilate seized upon, though, was this was the role of a king. Instead of delving into the nature of his kingdom, Pilate pursued Jesus' role as a king. He said, you are a king then. Again, Jesus answered him in a way that should have piqued Pilate's curiosity. In verse 37, he said, you are right in saying, I am a king. In fact, for this reason, I was born. And for this, I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What an opportunity the Pilate was given here. Faced with the Son of God, inviting him to learn eternal truths. But Pilate replied, what is truth? Pilate seems to be submissive here, and the evidence being that he doesn't even stick around for an answer. Had he waited, he could have learned more of what Jesus had to say. Jesus said that truth comes from above. It comes from God. And this is the very idea that Plato had concluded. Apart from revelation from God, we cannot know absolute truth. Had Pilate uh, dwelt on what Jesus had said, he, he would have realized that Jesus' purpose was to reveal the truth. He said, for this reason I was born. One purpose then of Jesus' incarnation was to reveal the truth to men. Had, had, uh, had he thought about it, Pilate would have realized that Jesus was no mere man, but God. Jesus said, for this I came into the world. The implication being that he had existed prior to his incarnation. He is God. So Pilate missed out on a great opportunity. So let me give you the principle for these verses. And that is that all truth is based on the person of Jesus Christ. Pilate had surely been educated in the teachings of the Greek philosophers. They had debated for years this concept of truth. And many had concluded that truth, if it existed, was abstract. It was impersonal. But standing before Pilate, Jesus shows us that truth is not an impersonal uh, or abstract concept. No, truth is, a, is personal. It's bound up in a person. Even today, people argue that we can't possibly know the truth. What they're really saying is they don't want to know the truth. To know the truth, then, is to be obligated to obey it. Sinners don't want to do that. So they deny the existence of absolute truth. The only truth that they will acknowledge today is that which is defined for, by, by, by each of us, our, our own personal truths. But truth is an entity. It is singular. Jesus didn't say, I came into the world to testify to truths, plural. He came to testify to the truth 
singular. What he was saying is that all truths are rooted in one truth, that is, in the God of creation. All the physical laws of nature are tied up in Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so to acknowledge the truth requires us to submit to Christ's authority. As king, he rightly claims absolute authority over our lives. So the obvious question then is how do you and how do I respond to the truth? Pilate walked away from Jesus. And that's what many people try to do. But to walk away from the truth is to reject him. And rejection of the truth is to miss out on eternal life. It is to stay in our current sinful state. Now, having concluded his initial interrogation, Pilate went outside again to the Jewish leaders. In verses 38 and 39, he did two things. First of all, he announced his finding of innocence. He said, I find no basis for a charge against him. See, Pilate had understood Jesus' claim as king, at least well enough to know that he was no threat to Rome. Had Pilate been a man of integrity, his verdict at that point would have ended the, uh, the whole matter. But he was not a man of integrity, and we see that from his next move. Because the second thing he did was, given the fact that it, it, there was the custom in, at, during Passover for the governor to release one prisoner to the Jews. According to Matthew, Pilate gave the crowd a choice, Barabbas or Jesus. Now, Pilate likely thought that he, would for, he could force the leader's hands. Surely the crowd would choose Jesus over a criminal. Wrong. Pilate had underestimated the leader's hatred of Jesus and their ability to ma manipulate the crowd. So, who was this Barabbas? Well, all four gospel accounts mention him. Today, we would call him a terrorist. He was a, likely a Jewish zealot, an insurrectionist from the Roman perspective. At the urging of the chief priest, the, the gathered crowd chose a man who had committed murder in his struggle against Rome. And while condemning a man uh, who, had no, who uh, was of no threat to Rome, Pilate had really gotten himself into a pickle. His solution, his proposed solution, was actually overruled by God's sovereignty. And the result provides us with a great illustration of the grace of the gospel. Guilty Barabbas was set free, while innocent Jesus took his place. I once saw a guy wearing a t-shirt that read, Free Barabbas. And I asked him about it, and he said, I'm Barabbas. Well, the, the reality is we are all Barabbas. We are all guilty of innumerable crimes of insurrection against our God, only to be set free because Jesus took our penalty. But Pilate wasn't done. He had another idea. He had Jesus flogged. Presumably, he reasoned that his reasoning was that his punishing of Jesus would satisfy the bloodthirsty crowd. It was, it was another attempt at compromise. You see, the, the Romans administered different types of beatings. Of course, the most brutal was scourging, which usually preceded crucifixion. And scourging occasionally killed the victim. It's unlikely that Jesus was scourged at this moment, at this point. Pilate had declared him innocent but he was apparently trying to appease the crowd. The soldiers mocked Jesus with a robe and a crown of thorns, and they mocked him by hailing him king of the Jews. They beat him about the face. All of this part was part of his humiliation, his, his taking on sin for us. And all of this was God's plan, but, but it was still a great sin on Pilate's part. He had announced Jesus' innocence, and yet, he had him mistreated and for no good. Rather than appease the crowd, though, it seemed to stir them up even more. And we see this in chapter 19, verses 4 to 6. Pilate brought Jesus out and said, here is the man. I, I like the way the King James Version says. He says, behold the man. 
as if to say, look, you Jews, can't you, can you not see this man is innocent? Hasn't he suffered enough? Well, in Pilate's mind, Jesus was no king. But in reality, he is the greatest king of all. And yet for all of his majesty, Jesus was willingly, he willingly suffered for our sins. Pilate's appeal to their pity failed because the Jewish leader hated Jesus so much that only his death would satisfy them. In fact, they hated him so much that only the worst form of death would satisfy them. Frustrated, Pilate said, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. Now, up to this point, the Jews had stressed the kingship of Jesus' claims. But their next response came closer to the truth. They cried, for we have a law, and according to the law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. Uh, that This claim clearly struck a chord with Pilate. He, he was even more afraid. The pagans of that time believed in a class of God-men who, while living amongst mere mortals, they had divine powers. And he had good reason to be afraid because he had just ordered the whipping of just such a man. So back into the palace, he went to question Jesus. Now this time he asked, where do you come from? And this time he got no answer. And this disturbed him. He asked, don't you realize I have power either to free you or crucify you? And at this point, Jesus' answer, I think, stunned Pilate. He said, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of greater sin. Jesus revealed, the, revealed to Pilate that the hand of God was behind his authority. He'd not be in the position of governor if it were not for God. Even evil people cannot escape God's sovereignty. And yet, God's sovereignty never excuses man's responsibility. Who was Jesus referring to in that phrase, the one who handed me over? Was it Judas? Was it Caiaphas? Or all the Jews? Well, the Greek word translated there in my NIV as handed over is in the singular form. It's also used twice in this chapter with respect to the Jews handing Jesus over to Pilate. So it seems uh, best that, that, that Caiaphas uh, probably fits here. He was the one who prophesied Jesus' death for the good of the nation. And it was his critical leadership in the Sanhedrins in their conviction of Jesus. Jesus does not exonerate Pilate, though. He had sinned as well. But it was Caiaphas who took the initiative. And for my principle here, I want to make a point with regard to God's revelation. And the principle is this. If we ignore the truth, we risk losing it. Pilate had multiple opportunities to respond to the truth. Ultimately, he walked away from the truth, and now, at this point, he got silence. We have to be very careful not to think this principle applies only to unbelievers. We can't sit here and say, this doesn't apply to me. I belong to a good church. Or, this doesn't apply to me. I, I go to BSF. No. God is revealing his truth to us each and every week. And, and, and if we do not respond to it in obedience, we, we risk having him withdraw his truth or his light from us as well. It's, it's God's nature to give us many, many opportunities, but we must never presume upon his patience. So I ask you, what truths have you failed to respond to this year? When, when we receive revelation from God, he expects us to respond in obedience. Now, once again, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews were always one step ahead of him. They shouted, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. This was, this was no idle threat. Tiberius Caesar was a suspicious ruler, a quick to punish his subordinates, and he 
was favorably disposed to the Jews. The Jews, for their part, hated Pilate, and they had already complained to Rome about him. So Pilate knew that they would follow up on their threat. Now, what is ironic is that the, for the Jews to get Jesus crucified, they had to portray themselves as more loyal to Caesar than their own governor. Than, 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 than Caesar's own governor, excuse me. Well, with his hand forced, Pilate then brought Jesus out to the crowd, and he sat upon his judgment seat. According to Matthew, it was at this point that Pilate's wife sent him a message. She warned him not to have anything to do with this innocent man, but it, but it was too late. Pilate had made his decision. Now, while the verdict was not guilty, the sentence was death. Pilate had handed Jesus over to, for crucifixion. And this all took place on the preparation day for the Passover. That would have been Friday. There is some confusion about the timing. In verse 14, John says the verdict was announced uh, about the sixth hour around noon. John's timestamp shows that Jesus was crucified on Friday afternoon um, for the Passover. The, the Lamb of God was slain at the same time as the Lamb's were being slain at the temple. And so the principle here is that every person either accepts or rejects Jesus' eternal truth. It's a sad occasion when people know what is right, but they fail to do it. Pilate loved his power and his privilege more than he loved truth. He's an illustration of a lot of people we meet in life. Self-interest, self-preservation, are their primary concerns. Pilate tried to compromise with the world, and it didn't work. The principles of the world contradict the principles of the kingdom of God. Then, then Pilate tried to separate himself from the act. In Matthew's account, he washed his hands in a dramatic display, and he declared himself innocent of Jesus' blood. That didn't work either. Everyone comes face to face with the Son of God at some point. And there are only two choices that we can make. Either we accept him as our Lord and Savior, and all, that we, we either accept him as king or we reject him. Indifference won't even work. We must choose one way or the other. Knowing the choices the Jews and Pilate made, I ask now, what is your verdict? How do you respond to Jesus the King? He is the one who will reign over uh, an eternal kingdom. And he is the only one worthy of our following. Will you join me in prayer? Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, um, for the regalness, the d dignity uh, that we see your son, Jesus Christ, our king, display here during his trials. Heavenly Father, uh, I pray that um, this, um, this chapter, this lesson would um, grow our love for, for, for him even more, that we truly would worship him and serve him and follow him as our king, for he truly does um, demand our authority and rightfully we should give it to him. Heavenly Father, we pray these things in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen.